Okay, so we're, we're delighted this morning to have uh, Louise Fitzgerald from Trinity. She's uh, a fossil fuel divestment ca campaigner, I suppose, in the, in, 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 certainly in the past, uh, and an environmental justice campaigner. We're delighted to have her here uh, this morning to talk about fossil fuel di divestment. And it, it's, it, it's an interesting area because it's, it's about the only area in, uh, in Ireland where, where we're not a laggard in relation to climate, uh, uh, climate action because the government did actually agree to divest uh, the, the, the public funds from uh, fossil fuel and to reinvest the money in, in um, renewables. So that's a, that's a good story. What um, Louise is going to talk about is, is her experience, particularly in, the, in, in Berlin, which was a, a very successful campaign. And she'll talk about um, sort of the history and, and, uh, and the, the impact and what the future will be uh, uh, in connection with uh, fossil fuel divestment. Uh, so as I mentioned, she's, uh, she's from Trinity, uh, environmental justice campaigner, uh, been involved in various uh, climate um, movements and so on. So uh, thank you very much, Louise, for agreeing to talk to us. Uh, so it's over to you now. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, thanks so much. So yeah, thank you, Jane, for the introduction. Um, so I think, yeah, Jane gave a pretty good overview of who I am. So that's great. Um, so yeah, before before I begin, I just want to say thank you so much um, for the invitation and as well um, that I think there's something, um, and I've taught this for a long time, that there's something incredibly powerful about um, elders engaging with the climate issues. So I just wanted to start by acknowledging and um, yeah, giving my gratitude for, for you all engaging with the, the climate topic. And I just find it very um, inspirational and very, important so thank you so much um so yeah today i'm going to be talking about um the fossil fuel divestment movement which like jane said i was involved with and um, so i'm just going to talk kind of about the the history of the movement and its successes and some lessons for the future so um so just yeah quick overview like jane also mentioned um the, the first thing I'm going to do is talk kind of broadly about the fossil fuel divestment movement and then share my own personal experience, which was based on fossil free Berlin. Um, I lived in Berlin for uh, three years and uh, during that time I was involved in the campaign there and from its start to basically its, its finish. Um, and then uh, in kind of concluding at the end, I'm just going to share some um, some kind of lessons I think that we can draw from the, the fossil fuel um, divestment campaign in terms of um, climate activism going forward or, or how we engage and empower people on climate action. So I'm just gonna turn on my timer actually, um, just so I don't talk for too long. Uh, Cause I'd yeah, love to have time also for the Q and A at the end. So yeah, just to give, um, to give an introduction. So, um, this slide here is from um, something called Do the Math um, by Bill McKibben, which um, some of you may have heard of him. He was um, the head of 350.org, which is one of the main organizations involved in um, the fossil fuel divestment movement. And he, he had something um, which he, he wrote an article for the, for the Rolling Stone um, magazine um, in 2013. And it basically went, it went viral. It spread very, very far. And really the power of it that was that he broke the, the climate issue and the, the fossil fuel issue down into very simple, basic math terms that everyone could understand. And so there were three numbers that he spoke about. Uh, the first was two degrees Celsius. And um, the second was 565 gigatons. And then the third number there is 200 and, um, 2,795 gigatons. And basically what those numbers are is the first number, I think everyone's basically familiar with it now, but the two degrees, which is the politically accepted level of global warming that all governments have basically signed up to in um, various international agreements. Um, and the, the second number, 565 gigatons um, of carbon, is basically what um, scientists such as James Hansen um, from NASA found was the safe level that we could emit into the atmosphere if we had any sort of slim chance of staying under that two degree threshold, which at the time in 2013, looking at the trends, meant that there was about 15 years left um, to burn fossil fuels um, if we were to have any chance of, of, of staying under that two degrees um, politically accepted 
um, threshold of global warming. And then the third um, figure is really the, the scary figure, the, the 2,795 um, 2, figure. And what that came from was um, work from the Climate Tracker Initiative in the UK. And what they did was they sat down with all of the annual reports of, of big fossil fuel companies and looked at what they had declared in their fossil fuel reserves. So what oil, oil, um, oil rigs had they already opened and um, what coal deposits had they identified that they hadn't yet um, gone mining for, but they knew were there. And basically what they found was all of those together added up to this huge colossal figure of 2,795, which is basically um, five times the level of safe uh, carbon that could be put into the atmosphere if we were to have any chance of staying under this two degrees. And the fossil fuel uh, industry was, was planning on, on, on um, extracting all this fossil fuels and burning them. Um, so this very, very simply and very starkly communicated the fact that the fossil fuel industry was just completely disconnected and really on a, on a crash course um, when it came to having any chance of staying under this safe um, two degrees Celsius. And this was really the, the kind of spark that then launched um, the divestment campaign and the kind of core um, ideas behind it. So, um, so we've spoken about two degrees there, but of course, as you all um, also probably know, um, in recent years, really, there's been a lot more noise around um, the 1.5 degrees. So like I said, the do the math was in 2013. And since then, you know, there's been increasing um, scientific understanding of how uh, 1.5 is actually the much safer level of um, global warming. I mean, right now we're at about one degree of global warming. We already see the effects. Um, and really, uh, and the, the IPCC brought out a special report, which um, a lot of you also probably remember where there was a lot of talk around how we have only 12 years left to half our, our global um, global emissions in order to stay under this 1.5 degrees. And in terms of uh, climate justice and impacts for low lying states and, and parts of the continent of Africa, um, the 1.5 degrees is really the, the one that we want to be rather aiming for than, than two degrees. So I think it's important to, to bear that in mind, which really means that there's even uh, less um, carbon that we can be burning. So the, the math, the do the math is, is even more stark right now. Um, and some of you may have heard um, uh, of 350 and and I think it's good just to explain um, where 350.org comes from which which like I said was one of the main um, drivers of the the fossil fuel divestment movement kind of one of the main organizing um, organizations globally and really um, it's just another way of communicating that um, 535 gigatons so rather than saying how much um, carbon we can put into the atmosphere it's how much is a safe kind of baseline level of carbon to have in the atmosphere and um, really the, the safe level based on that um, research from NASA was um, five, 350 um, parts per million. Um, so that's where the 350.org um, name comes from. Um, when this graphic was made, which was only a few years ago, we were at uh, 400 parts per million. So obviously way over 350. Um, and right now we're actually at about four, 409, I think is, is the latest. So really quite far away from that, um, that figure um, and just kind of communicating again, really the importance of, of, um, of addressing this and addressing the fossil fuel industry, which is gonna bring us obviously a lot, a lot, lot more carbon into the atmosphere when we look at the documents themselves they've been publishing about their reserves. Um, so, this then basically um, all combined was where the, the kind of keep it in the ground um, movement has come from, which is a, a really, um, really intertwined with the divestment movement. So um, you've also probably heard this keep it in the ground, anyone who's seen protests or it's a real kind of rallying cry. It's on a lot of um, posters and really um, the keep it in the ground kind of slogan is is. It, it's really um, implying, you know, the idea that really just to cut the fossil fuels off its source. So to stop, if we already know that we, um, you know, that there's there's five times the amount in the reserves, then we just need to leave them there. You know, we don't need to um, take them out and burn them and then try and figure it out when it's in the, the atmosphere or something, but really just to cut off at source um, the, the fossil fuel, the flow of fossil fuels. So turn off the tap at source, at the oil drills, um, at the coal mines, 
And in order to do that, one really key way is to to divest, to remove the, the money from these companies, um, which is supporting their activities, and also, um, more importantly, remove the, the kind of social license um, for them to do that, which I'll talk about a bit more um, soon. So it's it's really something around, you know, looking at the, the system. So really that stark realization that um, how disconnected the fossil fuel industry is from reality on the ground of what is um, keeping us under a safe level of warming. Um, and really looking at that system, that that industrial system and um, that put the carbon in the atmosphere and, and really targeting um, targeting our efforts on on that that system. And um, that's leading to these impacts, like I said, that we're already seeing today. So um, based on this um, really was born the, the like I said, the divestment movement and the fossil free campaign and they have a very, uh, there's a very kind of simple slogan and it says, if it's wrong to wreck uh, the climate, then it's wrong to profit from that wreckage. And um, we believe that educational and religious institutions, governments and other organizations that serve the public good should divest from fossil fuels. So really what that was to say is, okay, well, if it's, it, it's really kind of normative, you know, if it's, if, if it's wrong to wreck the climate, then it's wrong to, to profit from that. So it's wrong to be, um, investing your money in in these fossil fuel companies and then trying to get a return on investment when we know that their activities are bringing us five times over the safe level warming and 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 further than that because you know they they know what their reserves are and they want to burn the reserves but of course they're also forever looking for new frontiers of coal of oil of gas and um, and so really it was a call that um, different public institutions like educational institutions religious institutions governments and um, that serve the public good, that were public um, institutions need to stop uh, funding these activities, uh, plain and simple. So that was really the kind of core, um, the core motive uh, of the campaign. And it was really about ordinary people. So um, members of uh, faith communities um, university students and um, citizens living in a particular part of the world and um, coming together and um, demanding from their target institution, whether it be the government, whether it be the university, uh, the church to take their money out of these um, climate damaging um, activities. So just to give a kind of breakdown of the sort of institutions um, that, that are divesting, um, you can see it really spans a whole range of institutions. So we have you know, faith-based organizations and um, philanthropic foundations, educational institutes, governments, pension funds, um, as well as NGOs and healthcare institutions. And really a, a broad range of, of, different, um, of different public institutions, which are for, for different reasons divesting from, from fossil fuel companies. Um, so one really key point of the campaign and um, the divestment movement, I think, is um, summed up in this banner here, which is that um, divestment is a tactic and justice is the goal. So really, again, it's very, very um, based on, on, a, on a normative foundation. So divestment is, is the tactic or the tool that we use, but really at the core, it's about justice. Um, so very much informed by previous um, divestment campaigns, which um, you're likely, of course, also familiar with like the South African um, anti-apartheid um, campaign and the um, anti-tobacco campaign, which were all about divesting from um, really these, these normatively problematic um, institutions or, or just removing the social license from them. So it's again saying that something isn't right and that um, divestment is one way that we demonstrate that and one way that we remove the support and um, financial and, and really um, the normative support for these, these damaging institutions. So that looked different in different places. So for example, um, healthcare workers, like we saw on the previous slide, you know, they were saying that um, we can't be a, a healthcare institution and be caring about public health and at the same time investing in fossil fuel companies, which we know are having really severe impacts, whether it be in terms of air pollution and um, for people which we're increasingly understanding or whether, you know, the impacts of extreme heat and all the various other climate impacts we're seeing. So they said, okay, we can't claim to stand for public health, but at the same time be funding these sort of um, companies. Um, 
in universities, for example, um, their students said, okay, well, you know, your, your university, your main function is to prepare us for the outside world, to set us up to have a successful future. But how can you be really fulfilling that duty if at the same time you're investing in these fossil fuel companies, which are really actively undermining um, the basis of our future? So um, I think it's really yeah, key to get that across, that it was a very, very justice-based um, movement, as, as previous divestment movements have been. Um, so really about you know, climate justice, um, intergenerational justice, and, and, and the various ways that fossil fuel companies are, are, impacting, are impacting people around the world. So um, another aspect of the, the campaign, and another way this was communicated, was through something um, called the, the carbon bubble, which um, you may have also heard about. So this was um, based again on the work that I mentioned previously by the Carbon Tracker Institute. And basically what they said was, okay, so um, all these fossil fuel companies we've mentioned with all these reserves, um, they, they base their return on investment and what they say that they, they can give you in terms of return on investment if you invest in these companies on the assumption that they'll be able to burn all of the carbon in those reserves that they've already found and then hopefully look for others. But of course, we know that that will bring us over the, the safe level of warming. So um, so really, five, um, four, fi uh, four fifths, uh, if not more, of those reserves are what they call stranded assets. So it's assets that we can't touch if we want to stay under the safe level of warming. So you have this really paradoxical effect whereby um, public institutions and huge swathes of our economy are investing in fossil fuel companies that if we want to have um, a safe planet to live on, it will basically necessitate that we stop supporting these companies or that they can't burn all of this carbon that they've planned to burn and that they've sold um, themselves as a solid investment on. Um, so really that at the heart of the economy um, with so much money going into fossil fuel companies, there was this real um, pocket of, of, of vulnerability. Um, and they called this, and that's why the image is here, they called this the carbon bubble and that the carbon bubble was going to burst and that the more that we move towards, which we hope for, um, more robust action on climate change and um, thus necessitating leaving those reserves in the ground, and um, this bubble was essentially going to burst and all of the pension funds and public institutions that were, were, were funding these companies, had invested in these companies, were going to lose out with um, obviously clear ramifications for, for wider society. Um, so really, um, th this was kind of a financial argument and it, it's been picked up and a lot of you know, financial institutions are, are divesting based on this very, um, yeah, this very clear financial grounds for doing so and the fact that you know, renewables are increasingly more competitive than fossil fuels. But um, for me, again, I think there is really um, a normative dimension to this because it's to say, okay, if we know this already and we can already see this and we see this, for example, um, during the UN climate negotiations and um, whenever there is a, a clear hint that there's going to be more stringent action on climate change, you see the, um, the stocks of those fossil fuel companies really plummeting. Um, and so if we could already see these effects and we know that markets are you know quite jittery and that it, it only takes a little scare to to sometimes send them into free fall that um knowing this information then public institutions really shouldn't be investing public money um into into these companies when they know that it's it's essentially very risky and, and will have impacts for people's personal finances and for society's finances and, and things like that um with then obviously welfare implications so so again it's it's a financial argument but i think there's also this kind of normative underpinning that's that's important to to also speak to um so um one um other thing to talk about the divestment movement i think is really interesting research that was done a number of um years ago by the the smith school at um uh, oxford university and what they did is they looked at previous divestment campaigns like the South African um, um, anti-apartheid campaign and the tobacco um, campaign. And they, they looked at, okay, how did these campaigns develop? And what they, what they identified with that there's basically three waves of divestment. Um, and they looked at the fossil fuel divestment in the context of this and tried to map the fossil fuel divestment on these three waves 
um, that we'd seen in the past in previous divestment campaigns. And what they basically found is um, at the start of the campaigns um, in wave one, it's usually, um, it, you know, it, it's quite US centric. And um, this was in the case of the, the divestment campaign. It's quite focused on universities. So, you know, you have students get involved and that was certainly the case with fossil fuel divestment campaign. It was um, just a couple of universities um, and you kind of gradually have this widespread awareness of there's something called divestment and it has something to do with fossil fuels or, you know, the anti-apartheid anti movement. Um, and then you have it move into wave two where you see a bit of momentum build up and you start seeing multilateral financial institutions um, divesting their funds. Um, you start seeing more international, it, it gaining more international ground, it moving into Ivy League universities in the US and then faith groups um, also internationally. So churches and things like that, which are you know, really taking a moral stance. Um, and, and this all essentially accumulates to a, a kind of tipping point where then you see really um, pension funds divesting large amounts of money um, changes in market norms around whatever it be. So whether it be this, um, the apartheid or in this case, like I said, fossil fuel divestments. And then you see restrictive legislation enacting. So in, in all cases, in all the previous divestment campaigns they looked at, they saw that um, it started small. It started in these, you know, a couple of universities and through these waves, it, it essentially uh, culminated in, in more restrictive legislation against um, against the, the target um, the target that was being um, called to be divested from. And um, the really wonderful thing is that we can see this also with the fossil fuel uh, divestment campaign. So I think when I got involved, you know, it was maybe like somewhere in wave two and then, um, you know, we gradually saw it um, tip into to wave three. And, and now we see, you know, more restrictive, even in the last recent years, more restrictive legislation around around fossil fuels in Ireland, for example, we had um, also a, a ban, a national ban on, on fracking, for example, which is um, a form of fossil fuel extraction with regard to gas. So we've banned that on the whole island of Ireland. Um, and yeah, really large, um, large funds of money taking their money, uh, large funds uh, taking their money out of fossil fuels. And um, so it's really, there's, that's just to communicate that we're, we're, we're I think very much in the third wave of divestment now. And um, so we had uh, Cambridge Uni divested um, a couple of weeks ago, the University of Cambridge and um, the biggest pension fund in the UK divested during the summer. Um, and I think right now, globally, it's about um, 14 trillion uh, dollars that's been divested um, from fossil fuels. So, you know, quite a substantial amount of money. Um, but again, like I said, it's it's more about this this normative development where increasingly through, for example, faith um, groups and healthcare groups and, and taking this moral stance against uh, fossil fuel companies and, and basically removing their their social license, saying that this isn't something that's right and we should stop funding this. And one way we can stop funding it is to take our money out as kind of a symbol. Um, and of course, it has also tangible effects. We see that um, fossil fuel companies in various countries are also struggling and no longer able to compete against renewables. So um, this is really um, powerful to see and really um, was really like a boost to us when we started seeing these, these developments taking place. And um, so it's definitely yeah, interesting research behind it as well. So um, then, yeah, onto our, our own campaign. Um, Fossil, uh, fossil free Berlin, just to give you a little um, yeah, share from my experience of, of being involved in the fossil fuel and um, um, fossil fuel divestment movement. So um, our target was um, uh, the Berlin state. So the, the regional state of, of Berlin in Germany. So Berlin's a city, but also a, a regional area in Germany. Um, and they had a fund, a public pension fund of 750 million um, and about 10 million euro of this was um, was invested in fossil fuel companies. So it wasn't really anything deliberative, um, deliberate. Basically, they I think it was that they invested in the DAX, which is like 30 com uh, co companies that are um, on the stock exchange to invest in. And they just invested in that. They had a certain proportion of the money of the 750 million that they could um, invest and about 10 million of it um, through that action had landed in, in fossil fuel companies. Um, so our aim was, um, we had kind of a two-tiered aim. It was to divest from cl uh, climate harming um, investments as soon as possible and a climate neutral Berlin in the future. Um, 
So this was kind of two tiered. So obviously we were mostly for the, the divestment. That's what we were campaigning on. But we became aware that we didn't want um, through the city divesting that to potentially undermine the actions of a lot of other um, green environmental climate justice groups that were in Berlin. You know, we were worried that Berlin might divest and say, OK, we're you know, we've taken this amazing action on the environment and we don't have to do anything else. And then all the activities of other um, groups, whether it be around, you know, public investment in cycling or, or whatever it be, that um, there would be kind of a risk of greenwashing, basically whereby you know the go the government could say that they're they're great um, and and get a lot of promotion around di having divested um, and then us kind of would basically contribute to inadvertently undermining the actions of groups that have been around for a lot longer than us so we wanted this kind of two-tiered thing where we would say okay we're for divestment but we also want to climate neutral berlin and, and um we kind of built this into our structure. So we had uh, various working groups. So we had um, some people working on media. So there were some people who in their 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 day to day work were, were kind of in, in media work. And they um, they had a, a working group that was around media. So that was kind of to their skill set. Uh, there was a group who were focused on um, interactions with politicians. There was a group focused on networking with other um, with other groups um, advocating for a climate neutral Berlin in the future. Um, and yeah, this was a really core part, like I said, of our work that we we sought to build networks with, with other groups in Berlin so that when, if, when we got the, hopefully got the win that the divestment happened, that we could then basically help prop up these, these other groups that also had really important um, climate goals. Um, yeah, so that was our, that was our structure. So, um, that's kind of a key overview of our campaign. And so we began um, in February 2015 uh, on a very cold day in Berlin. So it was Global Divestment Day. Um, what we did was we had an action on uh, Berlin Alexanderplatz, which is, um, if any of you have been to Berlin, it's a very, um, yeah, it's a real focal point in Berlin. You can see the, the TV tower in the background. And we kind of did a, a sort of flash mob where, um, it was, I guess, sort of like public theater where we enacted the, the the Berlin bear, which is like a symbol of Berlin trying to um, run and 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 run towards a more renewable future. So it was it was quite visual. Um, we had just started a few weeks before that. We just started the the city campaign, and there was only a handful of us. Um, vast majority of us were absolutely new to um, climate activism. So really didn't uh, too much know what we were doing, but we were lucky to have the help of a, a more experienced activist for the few weeks that we were planning this. Um, so there was kind of a th theory of change behind this, um, which informed a lot of the divestment work. And that was um, to do kind of um, momentum activities. So kind of uh, flash in the pan, visual public activities like this, where we, um, you know, people could witness what we were doing but at the same time have more structural and um, incremental work that we were doing. So we had this visual action, but we also had with us a petition that we tried to engage people on and get people to sign, um, which was part of a public letter that we were building signatures for that we were then gonna send to the, the mayor of Berlin. So yeah, this was our, our very, very first action. Um, and yeah, we continued to do actions. So um, this, for example, is the um, Rotus Rathaus in Berlin, which is where the, the, the regional government sit and the mayor sit. And we did things like to try and get their attention. We projected um, a divestment and different calls onto the and got, got a very, um, yeah, very great visual. We were looking to have a, a photographer with us and um, take photos. Um, we did other things like um, yeah, we were, like I said, we were quite new to activism and we thought, okay, you get this petition and you get people to sign it. And once we have a certain amount of signatures, we'll send it to the, we'll send it to the mayor, which we did. And we thought, you know, that was it. And then we'd get an answer and we'd succeed. And unfortunately that didn't happen. So we didn't really get any engagement from the mayor. Um, and we were sort of at a loss of what to do. And like I said, there wasn't that many of us. So we started um, with the kind of limited resources we had, we started something called uh, Vos der Burgermeister, which is uh, where is the mayor? So um, basically what we did was we invited um, various uh, public figures from across, um, across different sectors 
to um, to invite the mayor for 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 a, for a coffee, for a tea, and um, to talk about the importance of divestment. So um, so the kind of the the visual we were trying to build up was that basically the mayor was missing on this really important topic. So we had, for example. Um, um, uh, a member of the, the the parliament, the national parliament of the of the Greens, uh, Green Party. We had the head of um, the head of the uh, sustainable bank in in Germany, the uh, GLS Bank. We had um, the lady here with the ukulele, a, a pop singer. So really, from across different sectors, um, and then here um, with the with the orange um, with the orange arrow, we have uh, it says instead of mayor, it says finance senator because that was also someone we we decided that we needed to target, and that's um, sitting there in the in the white blouse is Claudia Kampfert, who's a, a very well known and um, public figure on um, climate issues in Germany. So yeah, we we basically just and we did invite him, so we sent like a public invitation to him at every single one of these meetings that we'd set up, and there was more than this. There wasn't just four. Um, and of course, um, he never turned up. And then we had this quite powerful visual and building up this story that, um, yeah, the mayor was basically absent on this really important issue. Um, and we also, you know, it was a bit of, I guess, a bit um, sort of a bit of, of humorous or cheeky. But when we did things like we had um, film screenings or something, we always kept um, a chair empty at our events. And we had kind of a cardboard cut out of this arrow that we would sit on the chair and say again, you know where's the mayor and we'd always invite him to our events and of course again he wouldn't turn up um so this was kind of one example of what we did and um, another thing we did uh, sort of parallel to this was um a postcard campaign so this was for um public figures or experts who you know maybe wouldn't have the time capacity to sit for an hour waiting for the mayor that wasn't going to turn up um, and instead we just asked them to send um you know a profile picture of themselves and then a reason why they think Berlin should divest. So in this case, it says you know, Berlin um, has to get out of um, coal, oil and gas. And then this is, um, in this case, uh, Professor um, Hans Joachim Schnellhuber, who's a very uh, world renowned um, uh, climate um, researcher. And he says, because we have to put money in um, um, conserving the planet um, rather than in the uh, destruction of the planet. So. This was um, inspired by the Urgenda campaign who did something similar, um, which is the campaign in the Netherlands, which um, had that very famous and successful um, court case against the government with regards to their lack of action on climate change and won it. And then in Ireland, um, we've also had our own um, climate uh, court case. And they had a, a similar thing where they got various people to, to say why they, the, 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 the case was important to them. And um, so that's something else we did. Um, and then eventually, after all these different actions, um, we started really getting attention. So um, here, this newspaper, it's one of the biggest newspapers in Germany. There was a two page um, coverage of the divestment campaign, also um, more uh, globally and looking at Germany, but also um, interviewing members of our campaign because we were one of the, the few around um, at the time. And um, so, you know, we were all kind of really taken aback. And if you see there, there's also the picture of um, the, the parliament and um, the regional parliament building, which I which I showed you previously. And that got a really big coverage. And um, we got invited increasingly to talk at events. So that's us, some of us um, up above there talking at um, talking at the Berlin Climate Day and then also got invited to to give talks at. Um, on, on the topic of divestment in, in kind of various um, in various different forum. So um, we also got attention from um, from politicians. So here is us um, um, with a couple of members of the, the regional uh, Greens um, in Berlin who were supporting us and um, helping us get the, the divestment issue into the parliament there. And then basically after about a, a year and a half of our campaign, we won. So um, despite not thinking that, many not thinking that we would make it. Um, yeah, nearly, I think it was nearly a year to the, a year and a half to the day, uh, Berlin agreed to divest um, from fossil fuels, so to take their money out of fossil fuels, um, which was really, um, it, it, it sent kind of ripple effects through the movement in, in Germany and worldwide, because like I said, this is about norms and about um, taking a stance against the, the, 
the fossil fuel industry. So although it's only 10 million, which you might think is, is you know, not that much amount of money, the fact that Berlin, which is, you know, the capital of Germany, which is um, known worldwide for their action on, on climate issues, had divested was really um, amplified um, outwardly. And in the context of Germany, the in order to divest, um, the regional government set up a new, um, they set up a new uh, fund, which was basically clean from fossil fuels. It was like a new index. Um, and I think if I'm not mistaken, it was also clean from other things like um, uh, child labor and nuclear and weapons and things like that. And this index could then be used by other, um, other cities and other uh, regional areas and uh, municipalities in Germany. So it meant that it made the divestment work of a lot of other campaigns that were already taking part in Germany that were maybe uh, a bit further behind than ours or had recently set up. It made them uh, a lot easier for them because they could basically say, okay, look, there's this fund that you can just directly take your money out of and put into. Um, so yeah, it was really um, a really good day um, when that happened. Um, so, and then, yeah, like Jane mentioned, um, I kind of had the pleasure of moving back from Berlin and then shortly after Ireland uh, divested, um, which was quite amazing. And yeah, like Jane said, it's really one of the areas that we've shown um, really important leadership on. So um, we became the, the first country to divest from fossil fuels, um, which again was amplified worldwide. It was on newspapers everywhere and um, messages coming in from all around the, the world about how important it was and giving a real boost to other other campaigns to see that it you know it is possible so we divested um and it was the result of a, a private member bill by um thomas pringle who's an independent for donegal and a lot of work behind the scenes by um particularly trocra who um were really active on the issue because they of course are in active in, in many countries that are experiencing the, the impacts of climate change already. And um, so they were really from a from a climate just a point of view. So to say that, um, you know, those who aren't contributing to the to the climate issue or are contributing the least are those that are worst impacted by it. And, and one thing that Ireland could do to try and um, again, remove the social license or to stop supporting would be to divest. Um, and as well as that, um, there was members of the the Trinity, the TCD um, divestment student um, campaign who had a few months previous to the Ireland um, divestment Trinity had divested and they had built up kind of an, a knowledge and an understanding of divestment. So they were also able to contribute um, behind the scenes. So yeah, it was a really um, wonderful thing when that happened. Um, and it means that when you look at the notable uh, divestment commitments, which are on the 350 website, um, Ireland there our big flag is is represented so it's still um being you know published publicized and um you know we see here as well there's the Norwegian um, sovereign wealth fund that is divested you see a number of um faith groups again world uh, council of churches the Lutheran world um federation as well as the city of Oslo uh, the guardian Leonardo DiCaprio foundation so um that foundation obviously does a lot of work on conservation and said okay we can't um that we can't support fossil fuels anymore and then as well we see the British medical foundation uh, association so again um the idea of healthcare saying if it's for, you know that climate change ultimately is also about public health and um, so we need to stop funding these um these companies um so uh just to kind of um before ending i think there's just some sort of key reflections i'd like to share and some lessons um that i think we can draw from the divestment movement which has really been um you know so so successful like one of the most successful uh environmental movements of, of recent decades um and i think you know everyone's familiar with the saying but it really is worth uh, reflecting on uh, this idea of of think global act local so the really powerful thing about the divestment campaign was that um you know if we were in berlin in our city campaign or or ireland's campaign it's it's kind of local to where we are, but really it's connected to this big global movement. Um, and it was really, I think, important for us and important for, for other, other um, groups that I know, which were maybe even smaller than us, to, to be able to see the different divestment wins that were happening around the world um, and to see increasingly us 
going into that that third wave where we knew that it was just a matter of time that essentially you know divestment had already taken off and it was just about us being patient and keep going with our with our own campaign um, and you know it doesn't have to be um it doesn't have to be divestment that i think we can act locally but i think it's it's increasingly important for us to find um you know place based action that we can take but understand that um that that this is really part of a of a global movement of millions of people at this point who are taking action in in lots of different ways um, around the climate issue. Um, I think another really important point is to um, inform and empower people, um, but at the same time. So I think a really powerful thing about the divestment movement and how I experienced it was, you know, the do the math. Um, you know those are really stark uh, figures and quite frightening when you realize okay we've we've bought into this system that's going to take us five times over the safe level of warming and you know governments are funding it uh, universities all these really important public institutions have kind of bought into this and um, and that's that's really um frightening to, and very jarring to realize really how how the system is set up in a way that's that's so so damaging and already having such impact um so that's really important information to have but at the very same moment as i think you inform people you also have to give them something really tangible that they can do and let them feel empowered um, to do something about the information that they've just gotten so um i think 350 did a particularly did a really good job of this because um, a lot of the the campaigning materials and things like that that they had it was all just freely available online so if you heard about divestment or if you went to a talk or however you you came to find out about divestment you could go, basically go online and you had a whole um suite of things to choose from that would help you set up your own campaign or would help you understand how you for example maybe would go about divesting your own personal finances um so I, I really think that that's key. I think increasingly my sense of it is that people are uh, more and more informed about the climate issue, but what people are really lacking is that empowerment and, and that those avenues that they could feel that they can, they can have, um, they can still make a change. And I think um, reflecting on the divestment movement and my experience of it, of it and that empowerment is really, um, it goes beyond individual actions. So, you know, of course, in our day to day lives, we can take actions that um, maybe help us reduce our plastic use or or whatever it might be. Um, but I think there there's a different um, there's a different dimension or a different essence to the empowerment that comes when you work together with other people who um, share the same um, the same feelings of you about with you about how about the, the climate issue and the environment issue or whatever it is you're getting involved in so i think there's something very important there about being empowered with other people and um whatever that means and whatever that is that people can bring to the table so that was another wonderful thing was that there was really a acknowledgement of diversity and it didn't matter if you were a brand new activist or a veteran activist or if you were only interested in you know uh, you were artistic so you wanted to help make posters or if you were you know there was a whole suite of options and everyone was really valued as part of the group and everyone had a place and i, I think that's really really important and um, going forward to increasingly help people feel empowered and and for ourselves to seek out those spaces where we feel empowered with one another and to educate ourselves to engage in the climate issue and um, in whatever way we we feel and then the final um the final thing is um, something called active hope. So um, this is a term that I kind of um, found out about really, really more after I was involved in divestment, but it's been something that's really helped me personally. So I just wanted to share it. And um, the term active hope is from a book um, that was written by Dr. Chris Johnston and Joanna Macy. Um, so it's called, it's called Active Hope is the title. And really, um, what Active Hope is about is it's about cultivating in ourselves and in others um, a different idea of hope. So right now, a lot of us, what we base our hopes on is usually based on chances of outcome. So, you know, if we watch a match of our favorite team, we might say, OK, I'm hopeful that we're going to win because our team is better. So you're kind of saying I'm hopeful because the chances of outcome are pretty good. Um, but of course, when we look at the, the climate um, and environmental issue or whatever it is, if it's a social justice issue that we're interested in, um, 
it's actually really hard to know the chances of outcome. And, and that's for a lot of different reasons, maybe because um, in the media often, you know, there's negative stories that are shared a lot more than positive stories. And it's very difficult for us to have really truly a sense of how close we might be to, to the changes that we want to see. Um, so instead, what active hope is about is to say, OK, rather than having um, hope based on chances of outcome, which really can lead us to be down if we don't think that we're going to um, have a good chance or make us feel disempowered, uh, rather we should have hope based on intention. So really just to set your intention for what you want to see in the world and actively work towards that and base your hope on that, that you have an intention that you're following and and work with others and work to to basically bring that into being so um yeah i think on that note i'll, I'll finish um i'm really happy to to answer questions and to talk more and yeah i hope that was um interesting for everyone thank you so much <laughs>